thank you so much for joining us today. Um, one of the things I wanted to kind of kick things off was a bit of an intro, and I thought the best way to ask you about this is to say, what's the story a friend tells about you when they introduce you to someone new? Um, whew, yeah, that's a good one. So when I was younger, the story that everybody would tell when they introduced me to people was, she's the girl from Africa. That was the thing that was <laughs> the first note of like the bullet points. Um, but now I think usually what people say is she's a social engineer and she won this competition at DevCon. That seems to be like the top bullet on my highlight reel at the moment. Um, so that, that competition actually happened in 2019. Um, and I feel like that was like the, the front bookend on like this journey into information security, not really like the, you know, in movies, there's that like pivotal moment where there's like massive success and like, that wasn't that moment for me. <laughs> I feel like that's still coming, but, uh, it was one of those things that kind of catapulted me into like the Twitter infosec community as somebody that was recognizable by name. Um, kudos to my parents for the super unique name because a lot of people assumed it was a handle. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> really? And I'm like, nope, that's my legal name. I uh, <clears throat> didn't really think this through and I had my actual name as my handle uh, for like job resume reasons uh, and didn't change it before I did the competition at DEF CON and it was like, well then, I guess I'm known. Um, but I feel like it's worked out because it's unique enough that folks generally recognize. It's not like a common American, I don't think it's even a common name around the globe because I think I've found like three other me's. <laughs> so you get lots of disappointment when you go to the gift shop. You're like, where's, where's yes. my personalized mug? There's right. no Ailey. <laughs> You, I mean, there was so much pain as a child because my brothers all got their own magnet and mine was like super kid. <laughs> <laughs> oh, amazing. Thank you. And um, I guess you said this was kind of a, one of the books in the many on your shelf of life. Where, where did you first get started with um, this or social engineering? And how did that kind of take off for you? <clears throat> so I say this and people have given me crap in the Reddit comments about not giving examples. <laughs> I've been a little bit of a manipulative kid, <laughs> tiny bit, <laughs> since I was small. Um, I'm the oldest. I was born and raised in Africa. I lived there until I was nine. And then I spent a few years in the United States. And during that time, I was pretty loosely supervised. I'm trying to be kind <laughs> to my mom, who was preoccupied being a student. Um, but I mean, I had a lot of freedom. It was a different time. The mid 90s were a lot safer in California. And it was like, I had an opportunity to kind of create my own destiny. There were really no guardrails. And being the oldest and having to kind of grow up uh quickly i took responsibility for a lot of the organizational administrative stuff that was happening inside the family um but at the same time i figured out things like uh i was five foot eight in fifth grade so when i was 10 11 i was five foot eight already and so people generally thought I was older than I was. So when I was 10 or 11, they thought I was 16 or 17 at the minimum, because I'm so tall. And so I managed to convince the owner of a videotape rental store to give me an account in my name. I uh, was able to rent movies and I would bring them back responsibly and be kind and rewind <laughs> and all that good stuff. So it wasn't like I was doing anything that was underhanded or manipulative or destructive, but I used these powers of influence from an early age to get what I wanted. For example, when I was living with my father later, after I left California at 13, I went back to live in South Africa with my dad. And he had, uh, he was a professor at a university, still is. And uh, he had a visiting professor from the United States that came to visit South Africa. And as a courtesy, he wanted to show him around South Africa. And on the weekends, we went to this flea market. 
the whole family with this visiting professor. And we're standing in front of this table of CDs. And this is the late 90s. So CDs were cool. Um, and they're like, all laid out in front of us. And he's looking at all these CDs like, oh, this is cute. And <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I really like that band. And I just stopped talking. And he's like, oh, which one? And I'm like, the Soundgarden. They're really cool. And I just stopped talking. And he goes, well, do you want me to buy that CD for you? And I was like, oh, wow, that would be so amazing. And I let him do it. And it was like, court. And it's like a, you know, $20 expense. It wasn't anything large. But my parents were so ticked off at me <laughs> that I had allowed this guy to buy me a CD and manipulated him to do it. Like I hadn't refused the gift. So they made me write this like thank you note and then repay him with a $20 bill, which in South Africa is not super easy to come by. Um, so I had to send him this $20 back. And it was like a lesson in not being a total crap head. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think I learned it still at that point. <laughs> well, you were young. And so it's just, it's one of those things where, like, as far as social engineering is concerned, I had figured out how to make grownups do the things I wanted them to do. And I'd been manipulating my mom to let me stay home from school. And, you know, she didn't put up a really big fight. <laughs> but, you know, I'd manipulated teachers to do stuff. And I see this in my kids now, where they'll, I'll, I just had parent teacher conferences yesterday. And so one of the teachers was talking about one of my children. And she says, you know, they, they don't like doing the schoolwork, but they're very sweet. And I'm like, what do you mean? Well, every time I ask them to do an assignment, they, you know, tell me how much they love being in the class and how much they like me. And I just sat there and I'm like, that's a manipulator. <laughs> <laughs> and the teacher's just like, what? And I'm like, yeah, don't, I mean, that's just them trying to get out of doing the assignment. And she's like, well, I know, but like, I'm, curious as to why you're <laughs> acknowledging that and throwing your own kid under the bus but it's just uh I think we all learn as children how to get around certain things and how to be little con artists I just didn't ever stop <laughs> <laughs> and so in high school I was ditching classes in high school I would cry to get out of physical education because I just didn't enjoy changing into athletic clothes in the winter. <laughs> I found it to be quite annoying. <laughs> and when you're already wearing a school uniform, it's like, why? <laughs> so I would write my own notes and sign them as my dad. And I would cry to get out of PE. Like, I'm just so stressed out right now with schoolwork. And my parents are putting so much pressure on me. And the teacher's just like, go sit down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I don't want to <laughs> deal with this nightmare. But uh I just kind of never, never quit. And it really got me into a ton of trouble as far as like school and parents were concerned. My, my dad and my stepmom did not have an easy time with me. <laughs> um, so when I went to college, it was like, holy cow, I've got all this freedom. Like, I don't even have to go to class. This is amazing. <laughs> and so I ended up dropping out and moving back to the States in uh, 2021. So I arrived here in the United States with two suitcases with clothes and various knickknacks and uh, $200 to my name. And I moved in with my mom for a while before I could get my own car and my first apartment, which was horrible. And <laughs> just kind of like built everything from the ground up um, and had to get creative with you know, the relationships that I made, the people that I befriended, the jobs that I was able to get were all purely through networking with the right people. Um, I did start out working at a pet store for minimum wage. And when you're a snotty, self-absorbed, narcissistic 19-year-old kid who was pretty much told you would be a doctor or a lawyer or something important. And there was no universe where you considered that you wouldn't have a college degree when you left college. It was extremely humbling, but it was also amazing because it gave me this crash course in just peopling because you're dealing with the public 
I had a woman throw a dead bird at me. <laughs> like <No way. laughs> customer service is like wow. trial by fire. And so uh, she wanted to return the bird in like a week. And we're like, but you killed it. <laughs> like, what do you want me to do here? It sounds very much like a Monty Python sketch. Oh my gosh. It's insane. Dealing with the public is absolutely bonkers. So anyway, we, uh, I went from working in this little shopping center and just like this little microcosm of different shops and people and the relationships between stores and employees and all that stuff. And then I moved into title insurance because a friend of mine got a job as a typist and I was like, well, I just want to work with my friend. I don't even understand what title and escrow is, but it sounds like it's for me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, I have this, you know, random <clears throat> research and then, uh, telecommunications and then more title insurance and management. And then I switched into um, working for a startup that did automotive CRM software and then had a pet project that was a competitor to Instagram. And of course, Facebook bought Instagram. So we all know how that turned out. Um, but I was there um, like social media manager before people even acknowledged that social media management was a real job. And I did all of the user support, all of the like, um, knowledge base for users and then engage the dev team anytime I needed to work through like troubleshooting and stuff like that for the app. And then they moved me over into the CRM side. And I started doing that for all of the CRM clients and users. Um, and if you've ever had to like social engineer a used car salesperson, like, <laughs> good luck <laughs> because they know all your tactics. They're like, sure. <laughs> when you're like, well, I can't reproduce it over here. So, um, but <clears throat> after that, I mean, I, I was like three help desk migrations <laughs> in to this role. Um, and it was like I, I had a recruiter that approached me saying, hey, somebody who used to work where you work said that you might be the right person for this job. And I was like, well, what is it? They're like, oh, it's market intelligence. It's a lot of research. And I'm like, marketing intelligence? They're like, no, market. Like, you will research geographical locations for staffing and, like, job candidate type related things. And I was like, this sounds like. It's completely not me, but I mean, I guess we'll do the interview. Um, and so I did the interview and I just completely clicked with the director who was running the group and she's just incredible, super smart. And uh, she had me come on to the team as the online content professional. And so I was essentially supposed to take all of the staffing companies research and they're like a global multi-billion dollar staffing company, all of their research, and then like create articles that were accessible to just anyone who was reading it, make it very non-scientific and then help them boost their social media and online blog type presence with this thought leadership, which is kind of like a oh, dirty word cool. in InfoSec, but... <laughs> <laughs> At the time, that was the goal. So <clears throat> I started working there. And from the time I started to the time that I left, it was about five and a half years. And over that time, I went from being just a writer to an analyst to a consultant and then managing the consulting group. And then my manager moved up to like a VP role and uh, they were wanting to put me into the director role. But they wanted me to have all kinds of travel requirements and it was consulting, which I liked, but it wasn't necessarily what I was interested in pursuing as like a lifetime career. And you're going, yeah, but at this point, like you've had 20 years work experience, aren't you already in like your lifetime yeah. careers and this <laughs> it? And I had uh, competed at DEF CON the year before and won the social engineering capture the flag and been honored with the black badge from DEF CON. And I just was like completely consumed <laughs> by this idea of working in information security. And at the time I thought, you know, I want to do social engineering assessments. I want to do security awareness training and education. And uh, this was where my skills were at the time. And I was like, this is what I'm going to do. And so I started applying for all these jobs 
in information security and all these people reviewing my resume were going, huh? <laughs> like it says you have a black badge here, but none of this job experience makes sense. Like none of it. Like, aren't you a pen tester? And I was like, no. <laughs> like at the time I didn't have any of those, you know, more technical pen testing skills, like zero. And so I was like, oh no, this is bad. <laughs> like, I don't know how to close this gap. So I started consulting on my own with the blessing of my boss. She's like, yeah, it doesn't conflict with anything we're doing. Like, have at it. And so um, I started doing like the random security awareness training here and there. And I would go to, you know, local businesses in this Northern California area and present trainings and then do phishing tests for them. And um, it was really fun to get out there and get to do it. But it was also something that kind of consumed so much of my time because I was having to market the stuff, sell the stuff, show up and do the stuff, write the reports, send the reports, bill it, and then, you know, chase down invoices and essentially do everything. And it was super just impossible for me to see how I could do this at a volume that would allow me to do it full time. And so um, I ended up meeting someone on Twitter who was using an alias Twitter account, just like not even their real name. And they're like, Hey, I saw you're looking for a job. You know, did you have any idea of what you want to do? And I'm like, you know, honestly, no, I don't know what I want to do because I feel like I'm standing in the middle of a video store and I'm reading the backs of all the DVDs, which are like all the jobs and in information security. Right. And you flip over the back cover and it's like this description of a job but it doesn't actually tell you what the job is about. It's just like the fluffy stuff that is what they're trying to use to get you to rent the movie, but it doesn't actually tell you what you need to know or what you're going to be doing every day or what that's like. And so I was like, I really have no idea what I want to do. And they're like, well, we might have an opportunity here for a consultant. If you're still interested in consulting, it would just be like, shifting from staffing company and market intelligence and telling giant fortune 100s where to put their next call center to telling smaller uh, infrastructure and critical infrastructure related organizations where to improve their security programs. And I'm like, I can point out all the mistakes people are making. Like that's my favorite thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> So they offered me a job as a consultant and I started working at Critical Insight at the end of 2020. And I was like, within two or three weeks, I'm like, it really is just consulting. Like it's all the same. Consulting is consulting is consulting. Does not matter what industry you're in. It's just a different subject matter. And so I spent uh, about 18 months there and I did uh, HIPAA, um, SRAs and uh, ISO assessments and started doing the early versions of the CMMC assessments and uh, helping hospitals and cities and counties prepare for uh, Armageddon and get their security programs in order. And if they didn't have security programs or they didn't have the budget or the funding to stand one up or the resources, I could come in and talk about adequate staffing and allocating budget for certain things and help them to basically, I was like the anger translator <laughs> for <laughs> the IT and the security folks, which sometimes were one person who was IT and security combined. Um, and I would help them to describe to their leadership what they needed and then validate that, which is really social engineering when you think about it, because I'm saying, yes, what they told you they need, that's actually what they need. And you're going to give it to them. <laughs> and that's what this report says. <laughs> and so that was, it was really rewarding to feel like I was helping those people have a voice within their organizations, helping hospital IT administrators get their, you know, proper resourcing and have the, you know, foot to stand on to say, we need to start doing uh, tracking of our devices and better management of our, you know, mobile devices and iPads and tablets and things. And just that very like ground layer 
of stuff that we all think is very basic is what a lot of these organizations are just grappling with starting and having it remain a consistent process within the organization. And so for me, that was eye-opening. And it felt like we were really doing something meaningful. But what I learned in that process was I'm a heck of a lot more enthusiastic about breaking stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I had an opportunity to join Bishop Fox within the last few months. and. Uh, they offered me a position on their red team as sort of their social engineering focused individual. And the way I describe it to my mom is if you've ever seen that show Leverage, I'm the grifter. <laughs> 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 like I am not <laughs> the super like technical computer hacking person. Like I have to make that clear <laughs> to my family because they're like, can you fix my printer? No. No, I cannot. I hack people. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I probably could, but no. <laughs> There's quite a lot to unpack there. Obviously, you know that's a great whistle stop tour of of your career there. I, I'm just thinking, you know, the kind of the roles you've gone into. There's a lot of things you you sort of went through there, from peopling in retail, you know, getting CDs as a child through. You know, I'm trying to be polite, but manipulating adults in mm, those situations. Oh yeah, no, it's fine. <laughs> and, and then going on to do the you know the market analysis and probably. I'm thinking that le leads into some of the open source intelligence gathering. And then mm -hmm. you just sort of casually dropped in there. You've, you'd won a DEF CON competition as well. <laughs> I'm just interested, you know, what, what are some of the key skills you think you picked up along that journey and, and some of the things you learned in those roles that weren't necessarily directly social engineering roles, but they've then been applied in your current role and career path? Well, I feel like reconnaissance in social engineering is the thing that gets skipped over quite a lot when we talk about, you know, behavioral analysis and um, microfacial expressions and all of those things. Those are important if you're reading people, sure. But if you're not prepared when you walk into a social engineering engagement or make that phone call with the information to back up your pretext, you'll probably have a tough time if not fail in most cases. So as far as reconnaissance is concerned, I started at that title company when I was 19. And very early on, I was doing like database entry of the documents that were recorded at the county to transact property. And so learning about public record, how to search it, um, what the documents did, like their actual effect on the property, what that type of document would do to the title or to, you know, liens, easements, all that stuff. That was all stuff that I was learning pretty early on, maps, how to read maps, what the different types of maps meant, if they'd split the property, if they were just mapping what was there, those kind of things. And so that that love of research, that started really early on for me. Um, and so, I mean, even in high school, I liked digging into stuff and, you know, finding out more information on things. And the internet was like, sort of new <laughs> at the time. So it was like a little bit more difficult back then. Um, but <clears throat> after working in the title company, then I moved on to telecommunications. And I was essentially a narc. <laughs> I was the inventory manager and um, the person who made sure that all of the sales reps were coding transactions properly and not stealing and all that kind of stuff. So I had, I had like, <laughs> I had many complaints and grievances filed against me and I'd have to like show up and like explain myself <laughs> with the sales rep and their union rep. And I'd be like, look, <laughs> here's the pattern of behavior. These are all the things you coded wrong. I'm not picking on you. <laughs> You're just doing it wrong. And so uh, having the ability to kind of put together like an investigation was super fun. Um, and that really helps now when I'm trying to uh, do reconnaissance against a company and figure out who the employees are, figure out what their job titles are, what types of software they use, applications that they're using, things that I could use to pretext as that would get their attention and, you know, encourage them <laughs> to click on something um, and kind of going back to that influence and encouragement to take action while I was working for the automotive CRM uh, software company, 
they also started offering PPC or pay-per-click marketing and SEM search engine marketing to their dealership clients. So I was managing like $10,000 and up spend per dealership and doing all their pay-per-click ads. And I <clears throat> had a baby and then within a month got AdWords and being ad certified. And I took like three days off for maternity leave because that's startup life. Um, and so I was doing all of this work to learn how to put together really engaging, very short, <laughs> uh, you know, pay-per-click ads and uh, linking those to the best place to get the person to actually follow that call to action, order the thing, book the meeting, see the car, drive the car, that kind of thing. And so that work really helped when it came to figuring out how to craft an email that would be an excellent fish. Because if you think about it, phishing emails are very similar to when you're learning how to craft an email for marketing purposes. You want someone to take action. You want them to see the value in taking action based on your call to action. And you want to give them the opportunity to do so at many places within that email. Um, and so that really helped me uh, writing blogs, doing search engine marketing, doing uh, email marketing campaigns, and the pay-per-click marketing all are skills that I use today. So the research from Tidal and Telecom, the marketing skills from Automotive CRM and uh, photo sharing application land, and then this market intelligence job used all of those skills to look at workforce markets and go, yes, there are enough people that live in this geographical area who have these skills to do this job, and it's most cost efficient in this market as opposed to that market, and putting together the story for my clients built up the consulting skills as well. That and like all the PowerPoint and Excel. <laughs> I mean, you cannot get away from PowerPoint ever <laughs> no. in consulting. It just never ends. Um, but yeah, everybody was like, <laughs> information security is amazing. You're going to get to do all this ponage. And I'm like, nope, just over here in the Excel spreadsheets, <laughs> losing my mind. Um, so yeah, I think that even though it seems like all these things are super disconnected, all of these scan like skills were 100% transferable between these different roles. Amazing. I think, um, again, so much to unpick there. I think love the, uh, I guess, symbiotic relationship with marketing and influence to social engineer others. What, what would you think is a common myth or something that people misunderstand about the role of a social engineer? <sighs> Ooh, this is my favorite question to answer now. So when I started working towards a job as a social engineer, I thought you could get a job as a social engineer. <laughs> and that is something that I think a lot of people also have the belief that you can get hired exclusively as a social engineer. And I have at least two or three people approach me every week asking how to do that? And the quick answer is you can't. Um, this is something that is more like a tool to use in a job rather than a job title. So in the job that I had previously, where I was doing security assessments primarily, focused on that prevention part of information security, I was using those social engineering skills, but to elicit information from the IT and the security team, I wanted to know all their pain points. I wanted to know what they thought they needed. And a lot of consulting is just listening to your client, reforming what they say and telling it back to them so that they can then share it with other people who can actually have decision-making power and improve the situation. And prior to that, when I was working at the staffing company, we did engagements that were similar to like Undercover Boss, where we would send someone in to a client's organization as a new employee, and we would have them elicit information from other employees about what they liked, what they didn't like, 
benefits, why they were staying on board, company culture, <clears throat> just things that their boss couldn't ask them and get an honest answer as opposed to like relying on surveys and things like that. So, or I would set up calls and it would be very transparent where it would be like, hey, we have a problem retaining our contractors. Our full-time employees seem super happy, but our contractors don't seem satisfied and we seem to have high turnover on that side of stuff. Can you figure out why? So I would go in and I would talk to, you know, 20 or 30 of their full-time employees. And then I'd go talk to 20 or 30 of their contractors. And they would tell me like, the onboarding was super complex. I didn't feel like I understood what was going on. And those social engineering skills were coming out in leading that person and influencing them to tell me the truth about how they really felt about working there. Um, what I tell most people who ask me where they can get a job doing social engineering and information security is look at any job title that has sales in it <clears throat> because you will make a ton more money and you have the opportunity to earn commission and you have the opportunity to use social engineering skills on every single call you set with potential clients and repeat clients. And that is really where the money is in information security if you want to use social engineering skills. And I know uh, individuals who are making upwards of $350,000 doing that every year, which is bananas money. So um, as far as like, how do I get a job being a social engineer? There are many, many, many jobs that you can do that will use social engineering skills. But social engineering is a very small part of what I do even today. It is a technique rather than a job title. And so whether it's in the context of security assessments or a red team engagement where I am actually phishing someone, um, I would say that the focus needs to be on figuring out what job you want to do within the information security ecosphere and then figuring out what skills you have that are transferable into that role and where the gap is. Look at a bunch of job descriptions and see where your gaps are in the requirements, but know that you probably don't have to meet every single one of those requirements. If you've got a good 60, 70% of the skills in the job requirements and you're just like a little you know, confused on or not having one or two items that are maybe more application specific, that's ground you can make up. Um, but as far as getting a job in social engineering, it's going to be pretty tough. I seriously socially engineered my way into this role, and I legitimately expect someone to like figure out that I'm not supposed to be here and escort me from the building any moment. <laughs> Can we have your badge back, please? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, they're like, ah, no more access for you. Bye. <laughs> but the the jobs that I have had in the past few years have all come out of networking with people and making friendships and fostering those relationships and getting involved in the community. You can say what you want about information security conferences, but they are a great opportunity to meet people who are interested in the same things you are, learn from them, you know, find yourself in a restaurant till 2 a.m. talking about new ideas and things that you want to do and all that fun stuff. Talks and all that stuff is great, but I think the thing I missed the most during the pandemic was just those, those organic conversations that popped up at conferences when people are just you know, shooting the breeze and hanging out. Um, and those relationships that you create with people can lead them to recommend you for certain roles. Like my first information security job came out of a friendship with an alias Twitter account. <laughs> my second information security job came out of an introduction from a very well-respected individual in the community to Bishop Box and the folks that were in charge of hiring for the red team there. And uh, the opportunity that I had to go and train uh, individuals and contractors for the special operations unit of the United States Army came out of the Darknet Diaries podcast and a couple of the contractors who'd 
heard the podcast and reached out to me on Instagram. So I read all of my like super filtered, <laughs> like <laughs> could be spam, <laughs> scary DMs after that, because you never know what opportunities are out there. Um, and for me, it's been incredible the opportunities that I've had that have come out of doing and participating in a variety of different types of CTFs, the OSINT CTF with Trace Labs, for example. Mm. So really, the, uh, really fun CTF that. <laughs> on the um, the flip side of those friendships that you've got, so obviously you've you've met people in the community, you've got great friendships there. It's introduced you to new opportunities. When you're actually doing uh, competitions or social engineering engagements, you're obviously doing a lot of uh, open source intelligence research, sort of social engineering, working out, you know, for want of a better term, how to use people to get information. Do you find that that is emotionally draining because you're almost mentally forming a friendship by getting to know all these things about a person, what their job is, what their life's like, to then go and extract some information that's then used to write a report or win a competition? Yeah, it's hard. I mean, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I tell people all the time, like, I feel bad and they think it's a joke, but I feel like crap <laughs> afterward because it's, uh, I'm more of an empath as far as the way that I connect with people. And I'm also very introverted. So um, for me to like engage with people for like an entire day is super draining. Um, so when I'm doing an engagement, it's kind of like you're, you're at, um, like maximum anxiety and awareness of the situation. You're on high alert for like potential ways that this could go wrong, threats, things like that. And so <clears throat> it's really tough to be on like high alert for an entire day. Um, but yeah, I do the reconnaissance. I learn about the people and then I have to figure out how to build rapport with them. And the thing is, I try really hard not to lie um, when it comes to building those relationships because people can tell when you're being false about what you're interested in, what you're engaged in. And this happened to me even at a conference one time. I had been walking around this conference for two or three days already, and I ran into someone who was... Um, <clears throat> they were working in one of the vendor booths. They recognized me and I knew that I knew them. And we started talking and they said something about their kids. And I said, Oh really? Wow. That's cool. And they were like, you know, you know, I have kids like you follow me on Instagram and they could tell that I wasn't actually like super engaged in the conversation. And really what it boiled down to was I was absolutely exhausted and it was really tough for me to, I just have like naturally resting bitch face. So I have to like put effort into like looking friendly. <laughs> and so it's like, uh, I felt bad because I was like, I'm, oh, I'm not trying to be disrespectful or, you know, dismissive. And I know it came off that way, but I'm just so tired of engaging with people. It's not you. It's just, it's been three days at DEF CON and I'm worn out. And so, uh, I felt really bad about that. And I was like, I just need to stop talking to people for a while. Like I need to take a minute and like go decompress. And uh, I felt really bad about it. And it's, I still feel bad about it. And it's been years and it stuck out in my memory. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it is tough because I will talk to people about things that matter to me. And I genuinely try to build a friendship and they genuinely connect back to that. And so then when I extort them or influence them or manipulate them to do something, it just feels like I'm betraying them. And that really does suck. And so for a long time, I was like, okay, I'm done. I had like a few engagements at my previous, um, <clears throat> at my previous role where I was doing purely vishing. Um, and so I was doing a lot of assessments, but about like 20%. 25% of what I was doing was social engineering, actual fishing, um, but more blue team focus. Like, I don't know how to explain that in a great way, but it was less red team, like black box, go figure everything out yourself and more. We'll give you all the contacts. We're going to do this as a regular program and then 
do reporting and metrics and all that junk. So I was doing those things and I had a, a medical research facility that wanted me to socially engineer over the phone their HR help desk and their IT help desk personnel. I was to just call the number for the help desk and whoever answered would be the person I was socially engineering. So I didn't have an opportunity to do a ton of research on them. Um, but what I decided was I was going to send the IT support people to just a, you know, error 404 page to prove that I could get them to go to a link, like type it into their browser and then view a page. And as long as they could say to me, oh yeah, I am seeing just an error, like a 404 and have them confirm that, then I would know, yes, they went there. But my job wasn't to be malicious or to actually, you know, get access to their system or do anything that was going to connect back to them or anything like that. Plus I had like two weeks to test these people and I didn't want anyone to like recognize the pattern or for there to be anything like you've been pwned <laughs> like pop up on their page because then I'd be blown for the rest of the engagement. Um, so I was calling these uh, tier one, like the lowest level of, you know, entry help desk support individuals, the folks that reset passwords and, you know, help people figure out how to get into their email and that kind of stuff. And I would just call, pretend to be an idiot and ask them to go to this link. And I'd registered a domain that was, you know, their company domain, but instead of .org, it was .us. And so they would just go. And after about, I think the 10th or 11th person that I talked into going to the link, um, and I can still say that when I have given a link over the phone, zero people have ever told me no. Uh, to date. <laughs> that includes the competition at DEF CON, that includes everything ever. Um, but after about the 10th or 11th one, I was like, oh my gosh, I just feel like I'm clubbing baby seals. <laughs> Make it stop. <laughs> and so I asked the point of contact at the company, I was like, I think we have a broad enough sample of individuals to put together a report and uh, can I please stop now? <laughs> and they're like, well, is it safe to say that no one fell for the ruse? And I'm like, well, I think we should probably schedule a call. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was going to ask you more about that actually. The um, so the obviously to a client, the not falling for the ruse is seen as success. And I wondered if there are if you could share a story of like a, a different or a difficult rabbit hole you've gone down that you're really proud of to have kind of come back out of. So where you've had somebody <laughs> who is questioning your pretext and asking difficult questions when you're in that engagement and you know, what's happened to turn that challenge into a positive for you? So it's tough. It's really tough because just as an aside for the client, they want me to fail, but there's a caveat to that. Because if I do fail, then they're like, what kind of pen testing company did we hire? They suck. <laughs> like, what? And so it's like, we're damned if we do, damned if we don't. If we don't have any success, then they think that they've hired a, an inferior company to test them. And so, I mean, it's very rare to have a no findings report, but it does happen. And in that case, they're like, something feels weird here. Did you actually do something? <laughs> <laughs> and then on the converse side, they're like, you know, if we have all this failure from our user side, like, whew, that's tough for them to like stomach. And a lot of times you have the point of contacts at the company are the people that you're embarrassing, even though they're not the ones that ordered the pen test. They're not signing the check to pay the consulting firm that did the test. They're the ones that are going to have their program picked apart if they're, you know, found to have any findings, especially if they're critical findings. So it's this like, we got to find something, <laughs> but but we don't want to find nothing, but we don't want to find too much because then we look like jerks. Not that we would like ever sandbag ourselves, but at the same time, it's rough. So I had a, I had a gig recently where we're dealing with point of contacts within the company who are in charge of the security program. They did not order this pen test. They are not interested in the findings because they just want a glowing report because they're only doing this for annual compliance reasons. 
they're not doing this because they genuinely want, you know? And so I crafted an email pretext that leaned heavily on uh, the promise of a new job at a competing company for more money. And I sent this pretext, which is something, it's super common that you could receive an email in your inbox that claims to be a notification that you got a direct message on LinkedIn saying that there could be a great job opportunity for you here. Very common. LinkedIn is one of the most common pretexts used by the real life scammers that are attempting to get your monies. So I was like, this is good. Like majority of these people that they want me to target are on LinkedIn they all have connections there. Like this makes sense. They're on LinkedIn. This is a valid competitor. These are the actual salaries of these roles at the competing company, which were, I was like, who's making this kind of money? This is insane. So I put together a real job description in a Word document that was a legitimate job description from this company I was pretending to recruit for. And then I um, had a part of my team craft a website to have this careers page with this Word document on it available for download through a button. And uh, it looked so good. It was like spot on the careers page of this company that we were pretending was looking for a new uh, head of whatever. And so we cr I craft the email, wrote the email template. It looked just like a LinkedIn message notification. It was just spot on and had a link to this page that had the Word document in it. <clears throat> it was so good. There was no, no way I thought that this would not be super successful. So we scheduled the campaign, we send it out, and usually within the first 15 minutes, there will be a click, at least one, like at least one click. And it's kind of a two-stage fish. So they have to click on the email, go to the website, and then click on the button and download this Word document. And that's what we're testing to see is, will they click the link in the email? And then secondly, would they download something from a website? <clears throat> not particularly malicious. We're just measuring whether or not they would do it. And so we wait, and we wait some more, <laughs> and we wait some more, and I'm like, did it get there? Because nobody's clicking on it. <laughs> and it was like, this was the first time I had ever not gotten one click ever. And I'm like, well, crap, guys, let's black pack up the black badge and take it back to DEF CON because I clearly <laughs> suck at this. <laughs> <laughs> like all this work that went into developing the website and the job description and the word document and embedding all the things and making it look great and I'm like son of a gun anyway no clicks and I'm like huh. so I get on a call with the client later that week for just the weekly status update and I was like well you know we ran the campaign on Tuesday looked great I just wanted to confirm that you did in fact receive those emails <laughs> And they're like, yeah, no, they all came through. Everybody got them. I'm like, okay. Well, if there were any individuals who reported the email as a fish, it would be super great for us to be able to learn about that so we could incorporate it into the reporting and highlight that win for you. And crickets, crickets on the call, like nothing. And I was like, something here seems fishy. <laughs> A, I've never had not one person click it. I mean, I could see, click the link, go to the website, not download it. Just one of those would have made me be like, no, okay, I didn't do a convincing enough job here. But there was no engagement. And I had included the individuals who were my points of contact with the target list. So they all received the email within about 10 minutes because it was like metering them out to all the the people that we were targeting plus my point of contacts. So I was like, this is weird because they would have been like, oh yeah, we had one or two reports or three or four people reported it, something. Even if they didn't have like a, an exact number, there would have been a comment, nothing, total crickets. Nobody had anything to say. And I was like, this is so sus. I don't even know how to explain it, but I know they tipped them off. 
Like I can read them on the call. Like we're not even looking at each other and I know they tipped them off and it's because they don't want a bad report. So now I've lost the element of surprise. I'm pissed. <laughs> and I'm like out for blood. <clears throat> so at this point, I'm like, we're going to do a way better job with the next one. <laughs> And so I decided on a pretext that would be uh, just, oh man, it's so cliched, it's disgusting, but it's a dress code policy update from HR. So now instead of posing as an outside third party, I was going to pose as internal HR, but I'm like, how do I do that? Like, I can't spoof anyone in HR and pretend to be sending as them, which I've done in the past when I've been whitelisted and stuff like that. Um, but in this case, I wanted it to keep it external enough that it wasn't like I was actually impersonating someone from HR. So I found out what software they use for onboarding and I was able to get a template of an email from that software that was a notification of an overdue task. And I was like, let's build some urgency into this. <laughs> And so I crafted an email that essentially said that they had one overdue task to accept this new 2023 HR dress code policy. And I styled the email to look exactly like the notification from the software, knowing full well that there's no reason why they would receive this notification from this software. So I'm kind of setting them up to have a way to identify this as a fish. Like I'm setting myself up to fail by making it easy for them to determine that this is not normal. Um, but I'm layering in that artificial time constraint of the overdue task. And then I'm playing on their curiosity because in this case I was fishing executives and I was like, they're going to go, I didn't sign off on a new dress code policy. What the heck? <laughs> and just, and so that's what I was counting on. So I craft this email. We set up a website that had a browser in the browser pop-up. So the website had a button that said, log in with your Microsoft credentials. They would click the button and it would browser in the browser pop up and then mask with like the real URL for a Microsoft login page at the top. And we had a number of people that not only clicked on the email, but then went in to put in their actual Microsoft credentials, which we later verified on our internal pen test. And so I was like, success! And there's no reason why I should have been successful in the second one versus the first one, because I completely lost the element of surprise. We're targeting the same people. I made it it, the pretext was much less convincing and I made it easy for them to spot that this was not a normal practice. They shouldn't be receiving an HR notification from the onboarding software. It would be whatever platform they use for their policies. Like I purposefully did that to prove that the first time <laughs> they were messing with me. And when I sent the email out, I excluded the points of contact from receiving the email in the first wave. So the first wave was to targets exclusively. And then 15 minutes later, I sent a second campaign to just the point of contact. So they thought they all received it in the first <laughs> or the same wave, but they did not. And so because the point of contacts didn't have like a heads up or have the ability to notify the rest of the team that this email was inbound. And I sent it like four hours after I said I was going to. <laughs> I uh, was able to get a number of people to engage with the email and not only click the link, but go to the website and put their actual credentials in. So I was like, win for me. Sorry for you. <laughs> so a fantastic end result you got there. I, th I guess one of the, the challenging things and, and something, you know, you've gone on your gut there and you've, you knew something was wrong with that engagement. But a lot of the time in, you know, security things you you run the scan tool you tick the compliance checkbox all those kind of things but with with i guess with your work with vishing and other things how do you know when to stop is it just when you run out of time in the engagement or do you you know the thing about clubbing seals usually it's in the scope so they'll say you know you can target this number of individuals and you have so many campaigns with that engagement it was really only supposed to be one campaign but i was like 
<laughs> and so I kind of over delivered and I kind of, you know, uh, I kind of shifted things time wise that we had allocated the project in a way that made it a little tough for me. <laughs> but at the same time, I was determined that we were going to do a good job. And I felt like a, a zero wasn't going to be acceptable from the client's perspective. And I also felt like I needed vindication. <laughs> so typically there's some gray area where, you know, I can decide to do an additional campaign or we can adjust a pretext midway through. Um, and usually I'll explain to clients that, you know, any information I learn during the course of say a phone phishing engagement, I will then use later in in other calls. I'm not going to exclusively stick to a, a script that pretends like it doesn't know that I just learned these six things over the course of these 12 calls. And so that kind of helps me emulate an, uh, an actual attack because I don't think any attacker would ignore information that they found during the course of their, uh, you know, different layers of human and OSINT and, um, for the sake of red teaming, usually the <clears throat> it, it's not so strict in the way that the engagements are scoped because we're trying to very stealthily compromise an organization. Whereas with pen testing, it's very noisy and our pen testers will just go in there and like try to break everything. <laughs> and make a lot of noise and they don't care about being stealthy. Um, and those engagements are much more strictly defined. Like these are the times we're testing. These are the things we're doing. And these are the expectations up front. And we make every effort to communicate to our clients every step of the way, what we're doing, how we're doing it, what we found, um, and try to keep those things um, so that, they don't feel like they're unaware of what we're doing or how we're progressing. And I think that that element of communication is what's essential because if I get through a week of testing and I'm like, I'm struggling with this or we're just absolutely, it's just carnage, <laughs> then uh, we can adjust and try to make the engagement more meaningful to the client. I don't think that say, for example, in the context of that medical research facility, if I just kept, honing IT help desk people, that that would have been beneficial for them. So I was like, how can we use this time more effectively? And they're like, well, okay, like you've, I think you've proved your point on the IT help desk. What about HR? And this is interesting to me. On this engagement, the only person that challenged me from that medical research facility was a woman in HR. And most people think, oh, HR, they don't know anything about security. But I will tell you this, HR people are very process driven. They are very focused on the correct procedure and the policy to do things. And so when I called and I said, oh, yeah, I'm so-and-so from, you know, this property management company and your employee has applied for an apartment. So I'm just calling to do an employment verification. She immediately quipped to me we don't do those over the phone. You're going to have to send me an email. And I was like, Whew, I wasn't expecting that. So I was like, oh, great. Okay. Well, mm, what email address do I send that to? <laughs> and to like adjust my tactics. And so I took down the email address and I pretended I was going to go ahead and send the email. And uh, I waited like four or five hours and I was like, you know, I'll just call all these executives that I'm supposed to test as well in the meantime, and I'll come back to this because she humbled the crap out of me. <laughs> and so I, uh, I waited and I was like, well, I'm going to call the same IT or the same HR help desk number again and hope I get someone else. <laughs> and sure enough, I got the same woman and I'm like, oh, geez. <laughs> So I like just on the spot, I said, Hey, hi, we talked earlier today and you asked me to send my employment verification request to that email address. I did that. Did you not get it? And she goes, Oh, um, let me check. No, I, what, what was the employee name again? Yeah, no, I don't have anything for that. And I said, Oh, weird. I wonder if it got trapped in your junk mail or something. 
I said, yeah, I sent it earlier, like right after we spoke. And she's like, yeah, no, I don't have anything. She goes, why don't you stay on the phone with me and send it again? And I was like, gosh, darn it. (laughs) Damn it. (laughs) So I was like, oh, well, you know, this will just take a second. So I'm like trying to build this like artificial time constraint, like just answer this one question. And so she's like, okay. I'm like, I'm honestly, I said, because I'm like I'm trying to play to her like cynical like HR people don't like dealing with employees after they've been doing it for a while they get kind of bitter and so I was like maybe if I can like form an alliance like I'm sick of dealing with people too with her then she will empathize with me and we can do this together so I was like oh you know I just I just need to confirm that she does actually work there And she like laughed and she goes, oh, okay. I said, you would, I was like, great, she's into it. (laughs) And I was like, you wouldn't believe how many people lie on these applications. And she's like, oh, I know. And she jumps into a couple stories of her own about people fibbing on their, you know, applications for working there and stuff like that. And I was like, we're in. (laughs) So then I'm like, do you think you could just, you know, let me know if she does actually work there? And so I had her open up the system that she was working out of, pull up that person's name. And then I was like, it says here she makes (laughs) 650,000. And I wanted to give her like a preposterous number. And of course, there are folks that worked there that made around that because they're like super tenured and all that other good stuff. But this was like a lower level research person. And there's no way that they would be making more than like 60. And so she was like, what? (laughs) And then she did that thing that people do where they can't not correct you. And so she's like, no, she makes 63. I was like, oh, she put an extra zero on this application. And then, uh, you know, asked her a couple more questions. Like, does she actually live at this address? And then, you know, I have this social. Is that correct? No, it's this. And so I walked her through all these things and just breaking down that initial barrier And then forming that relationship where we were on the same page, finding that commonality and then escalating slowly into like the more sensitive information that I wanted to gain from her and using that, this is what I have. What do you have correction, but also having her, I mean, if I just said, hi, can I have the social security number for this employee? She would have been like, No. (laughs) And so figuring out how to maneuver around the process and then build the rapport and then slowly creep up to that sensitive piece of PII that I needed to gain as my trophy in the engagement was uh, something that I, it, it took the whole day for me to get to that point with her. Um, so it was, One of those things where just the persistence and the inability to know when to quit (laughs) is something that's pretty important when you're doing this kind of work, whether it's more, you know, technically focused or with humans. Um, But yeah, I, I don't know when to quit. (laughs) Yeah, there are a few. So um, on a personal side of things, being able to balance being a mother to four children and working full time is probably the thing that I struggle with most because I feel like, you know, either I'm failing as a mom or I'm failing as an employee, like at any one moment during the day. Um, So that's tough. So balancing now that things are going back to more normalcy and more physical pen tests are going to happen and travel and all those things. Like I'm 
really concerned about how I'm going to manage that. And I have an extremely supportive spouse, but I also, we are partners, like 50-50 on everything. We've got four kids and we split things pretty fairly down the middle. And so either one of us leaving for any amount of time puts strain on the other. Um, so that's something that I'm really concerned with. And then on the career side of things, I really want to step into a more, um, a, an area where I can be more comfortable on the technical side of pen testing. Um, and so I'm working towards a uh, certification to achieve that. I've tried several training houses. I've tried a bunch of different types of certifications and felt like I didn't really learn anything other than hacking a test to get the right answers. And so now I'm more focused on not only learning the things, but applying those practically um, and just using the skills I have to solve problems to prove that I know this stuff. Um, so yeah, I'm a little apprehensive about that in the future because I think that that's a direction that, that I need to go in to get more comfortable on the technical side. And maybe working with HR teams as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man, HR teams, yikes. I've heard every sub story. I t I'm telling you what, HR ladies are scary. <laughs> they are very, very process driven and they have no problem telling you to F off. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that leads us nicely into a question. So we do kind of a, a take a penny, leave a penny with our podcast guests. Um, and the question that was left from a prior guest for you was, is there any one individual or even group who has been especially helpful in getting you where you are today? Hmm. Wow, man, there are so many people. Um, one group or individual. I would say if I had to highlight one individual, I'll start with the group first. I'm going to do this backwards. So one group would be my consulting team at Critical Insight. Uh, they just, they gave me the opportunity of a lifetime. They welcomed in basically a non-entity as far as information security was concerned and trusted me to upskill very quickly into performing assessments and doing that work. So they gave me my first information security job and gave me the opportunity to grow um, and to learn on the job. And I will be forever indebted to them. Um, so tremendous amount of gratitude. I'm still in touch with a lot of those folks and I consider them like a brotherhood. <laughs> They're all dudes. Um, but they're like, my additional brothers and they've always been so great um just not only in allowing me to grow at my own rate and helping me find the right resources and giving me the opportunity of the job and learning on it but then being supportive when i needed <clears throat> backup whether that was you know technical knowledge and experience when talking to a client or whether that was me back channeling to them in a team's direct message to say, <clears throat> I think this client needs to hear what I'm saying from a man. Can you just tell him this? <laughs> because that happens, unfortunately, more often than they think. Um, so yeah, to, to a group, absolutely, it would be uh, to my Critical Insight team, specifically the consultants that I worked with there and the leadership. Um, and then as far as like an individual, um, I would not be where I am today were it not for Jason E. Street. That man not only has, you know, trailblazed a way for social engineers to be, you know, validated and accepted in this community as information security professionals, um, but he is the one who made the introduction of me to the Bishop Fox team. So I will be forever grateful to him for everything that he's done for the community and for me specifically. It's just uh, incredible. And thank you for being so humble and, and kind of sharing that as well. I think if there's, there's one thing I've taken from this podcast, it's just I admire so much how you are 
handling being a parent. You're a huge part of the InfoSec community. You've had this amazing career that you've got such a great way of telling the stories from. It's just been incredible. And all I keep thinking now is if our listeners want to hear more from you, where do they go? So I would say the best places to connect with me would probably be at this point, uh, LinkedIn. That's where the majority of my professional podcasting and other things will probably be shared first. Um, <clears throat> things that I do and collaborate with Bishop Fox to create will absolutely be on LinkedIn first. Um, Twitter is always great um, for as long as it survives. Don't hesitate to connect with me on Twitter. Um, and then recently I have joined Mastodon. And that has been a really fun community to be engaged with. It reminds me a lot. <clears throat> excuse me. Mastodon reminds me a lot of the old MIRC chat days, just okay. <laughs> in that it's a fully distributed, you know, open source platform where you've got all this um, ability to create your own communities. So I landed in the Mastodon instance that's infosec.exchange and Jerry is the administrator there. He's been doing a fantastic job scaling up. I think he went, and this is at the time of recording, maybe accurate, but he went from less than 700 users to over 7,000 <laughs> in the matter of like a week. <laughs> so he's been scaling up at like a ridiculous rate. Um, and things have just been really fun because you have this, like this, I, I don't know, like there's no, there's no hierarchy. It's all humans that are equal. And there's been a lot of sharing of real, you know, um, just real emotion and, information and resources and collaboration and people supporting each other. And I feel like it's just so much less toxic than some of the other platforms because it's not filled with all this noise and this content that you're forced to see. Um, so yes, you can find me on Mastodon. It's just at Aleth. So at A-L-E-T-H-E. -E. Um, and then you can find me on Twitter at Aleth Dennis because somebody else who hasn't used their account since 2017 took Aleth and I'm still mad about it. And then at LinkedIn, it's just forward slash IN forward slash Aleth. And you can find me there and connect with me there. That's great. Well, thank you very much for sharing those links and uh, some guys to those resources there. And thank you for sharing your journey from Soundgarden CDs to social engineering <laughs> critical infrastructure. It's been a, a really interesting conversation. Uh, some really great lessons there. And I think we've now made a lot of people think about going from, you know, cybersecurity and pen testing into sales, perhaps there, uh, which might not be a bad thing. Perhaps. <laughs> sales <laughs> engineer is a great opportunity. <laughs> Absolutely. Carl, Carl's just been messaging me about those very opportunities. So uh, who knows? Maybe we'll all change careers by the end of this podcast. <laughs> but thank you very much for joining us today. It's been a fantastic conversation. Thank you to Carl, my co host, uh, super producer Jesse and Sarah, who makes this possible uh, on our side of things. So thank you very much, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much for having me.